So this morning I want to talk to you about Ezekiel, uh, the passage that was just read, Ezekiel 43, 1 to 5, if, you're, if you still carry a Bible or if you look at it on your phone and you want to look at the text, it's going to be in Ezekiel 43, 1 to 5. I want to talk to you about that. I also want to talk to you about my recent trip to China and give you a little bit of the, the highlights of what God did there. It's, I, honestly, I have trouble talking about the trip to China because I feel a little bit crazy. I, I think it's partially because I still have jet lag. I just got back on Wednesday, and this morning I woke up bright and early at 4.30 in the morning, a little before the sunrise, even in northern Alberta, and, and was wide awake. And so part of it is my biological clock is still off somehow. But also, the stories that I'm going to tell you are not the kind of stories that I normally tell, because they're not the kind of things I normally experience. And I didn't go there looking for this exact type of experience, but it is what God did while I was there. So even to me, if you're thinking, those stories sound a little crazy, even to me they sound a little crazy. I get it, but they are what happened. I'm not exaggerating or making and the, one other thing I want to make sure that you understand, in case I don't say this later in the sermon, I want to get it out of the way right now. I am not the hero of any of these stories. The, the fact is, we saw God move in powerful ways and do powerful things. We were just the people over there. Uh, we got to witness it, experience it firsthand. You're getting to experience it through the stories. But it, I'm not the hero of these stories. Neither are any of the other human actors in these stories. The, the fact of the matter is, these are stories that can only happen through the hand of God. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. But let's look at Ezekiel chapter 43, because I always like to have a little bit of foundation in the scripture, even when I'm telling stories about a recent mission trip. If, in case you don't like my stories, you don't think they're exciting, and they're just fun for me, then at least you'll go home with some teaching of the scripture as well. Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest, both. That's a rare combination in the Old Testament world. Most of the prophets are prophets and the priests are priests. Often the prophecies are about what the priests are doing wrong. And so often prophets and priests do get, very, get along very well. Ezekiel is a very rare character in the Old Testament in that he's both prophet and priest. That's not a common combination. And he was ministering at probably the most critical transitional time in the history of ancient Israel. He, he starts his ministry right around 600 BC. And if you don't know, in 586 BC is when Jerusalem falls to Babylon, 14 years after his ministry started, in case you're not good at math. 14 years after he starts, the, the whole system, the whole Jewish faith is shaken right to its core. Because it was based around the fact that Jerusalem is the city of God. And, and the Jews are the people of God. And God will always preserve and protect them. He has their back no matter what. And this foreign army comes in. And foreign armies had surrounded them before, but they'd always fail. This time, the army doesn't fail. It's a slaughter. They smash down the wall. They break down the walls of the temple. They take everything. Every precious thing out of the temple. In fact, the, the precursor for that is set many years before. An, uh, some ambassadors from Babylon come long before when Hezekiah is the king. Like 30 years before the walls get smashed down. And he shows them all the cool stuff they have in the temple. Look at all this gold we got in here. Look at this altar. It's, this thing is solid gold. He shows them everything. And Isaiah, the prophet, one of Ezekiel's counterparts says, oh, that was really dumb. One day, their king will come and take all of this from us. And you shouldn't have bragged about what we have here. And that prophecy comes true in the time of Ezekiel, in the time of his ministry. And so, the early part of Ezekiel's ministry, he's saying, watch out. <laughs> Repent now. Turn back to God. The end of this whole system is coming. And when it comes, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be cataclysmic. It's going to shake you to your core. You want to make sure you have a right relationship with God right now. But in the second half of Ezekiel, the part right in chapter 43, 
43, he, that, that's already happened. And now he's ministering to people who are in Babylon. If you know the stories of Daniel and his friends, from, from the book of Daniel, about Daniel and the lion's den, or Daniel and his friends being thrown in the fiery furnace. These are stories from these people in Babylon. They were under a foreign king that didn't understand their religion. They were having to learn a new language and a new culture, a new diet. I know something about that. <laughs> it can be a disconcerting experience. Everything seems very foreign all of a sudden. And you, they were in the midst of that, and Ezekiel's prophecies to them are often about God's reconciliation, his, his return, his reestablishment of his people. And in Ezekiel 43, Ezekiel says he, he was on the mount, he's on the temple mount, and he's looking to the east. What lies to the east? Babylon, the very place the judgment has just come from. He says, but I looked to the east, and I saw the glory of the Lord coming to fill the temple. So he says, he, he looked to the east, and what he saw this time was not God's judgment, God's wrath, but God's restoration and love, and his glory coming. He's assuring the people that even though all of this tumultuous stuff is happening, he's still in charge. He's still the one that is in control. That it's still His glory, His power, that is the most important part. That the people of Babylon over to the east aren't beyond His power, aren't beyond His control. You know, I think there's a word in there somewhere for a congregation like yours that's struggling to find a leader. The, the fact is, it's not up to some leader to, to be in charge of this place. It's not going to be pick the right person, things will be perfect, and everything will go okay. If you, get the, if you can just attract the right person, if you can put the right package to that's not really the, the core issue. If, if God comes and fills this place, it'll be okay. <laughs> no matter who's in charge or whose name is on the sign in front, none of that matters compared with whether or not God fills this place. And when God's glory comes in this place and fills this place, things will be fine. And it's promised that that's exactly what God wants to do. It's what he wanted to do for his people when they were at a much lower place than just having searched for a pastor for a while. Their, their temple had been smashed down. Their, their best leaders had been taken in exile. And the few people that are left were taxed heavily by a foreign government that they wanted nothing to do with. But if they didn't pay up, they were killed. Their situation was worse than ours. And yet, Ezekiel still saw hope. I think that that's just that would be a great way to leave the morning. Just that would be a great testimony of the goodness of God. But I want to talk to you about a different east. Not really east for me, but west. Uh, I didn't go east to get to China. Of course, if you're good at geography, you probably knew that already. That you go west. You go so far west that I, I left on July 7th, uh, and I landed in Shanghai on July 9th. Yeah. July 8th didn't exist for me. It just disappeared. Somewhere between the time change and the international date line and flying late at night, July 8th just vanished. It didn't exist on my calendar. And, and I landed in July 9th in Shanghai, and um, pretty immediately God started to do some pretty amazing things. I want to talk to you just about a couple of things. Um, I want to tell you a couple of stories. Maybe if you put the first picture up there. Um, the people of China are very kind. They, and they have an amazing sense of humor, but they don't always know when they're telling a joke. So when you show up at the door, that's an actual water bottle for scale. Um, they'll offer you a seat. Even they'll offer me a seat. On a stool that big, that's a luggage cart, that's a water bottle. That's the stool they'll offer you, for, and they'll be quite gracious hosts. They, as soon as you come walking by their place, they'll often offer you a seat before they even know your name or why you're there. They, they just automatically invite you in. So they're very hospitable. They don't realize when they offer me a stool that size that they're telling a joke. They think they're being good hosts. I would see if they were laughing at me, so I tried to sit down on that. Uh, I would watch from people laughing at me as I tried to get up. And if they're in on the joke, they're the best straight men in the business because they didn't crack a 
smile even once. <laughs> they didn't even seem to pay special attention. They, they didn't seem to understand that I was in a comfortable situation. <laughs> they, oh, I forgot to bring in the towel. <laughs> they will, when you, when towels are personal items in China, people do not have guest towels, and they do not share towels. Each person that is traveling in China is expected to carry their own towel. I didn't know that, because I was staying, I was told I'd be staying in hotels and homes, and I was taking a very small suitcase because I didn't want to check a bag. So I just had a little carry-on suitcase. And I thought, well, I don't need a towel. I'm staying in hotels and homes. They have towels. Homes don't have towels for you when you come. And if you ask for one, they'll look at you like you're from Mars because they have one towel for each member of the family, and you're not one of them. They like you, but you're not. <laughs> they don't have towels for you. And if that happens, and they're a good host, they'll go out and buy you one, and I meant to bring it with me, but I forgot. It'll be this big. <laughs> Four hours of the day went by we visited another. 
another relative, and another relative. And then we were walking home in the evening. We were on our way to dinner and at another of his relatives' house, the house we were staying at. And I heard, for the first time in two days, I heard English. I heard A, B, C, D, and I thought, I'm pretty sure this time I really did hear you. That was the first time. That was the first time. And then I heard somebody else say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I turned to look where it was coming from, and there was a open doorway to a household. It was, the whole house was covered in ceramic tile, which is common there. And one of the tiles right beside the door was a decorative tile of a Chinese lion. Not a food dog, I know what that looks like. This was an actual lion. And, and I thought, huh, that's interesting. And I walked up to the door, and I sang. I thought they were trying to learn the English alphabet, so I sang A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way through. And they invited me in, offered me a stool, and I <laughs> sat down. I found out very quickly they weren't studying English. In fact, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, past that, I was teaching them new things. They didn't know the rest of the alphabet, because what the little girl was studying with the help of her father was geometry. And they were using the first few letters of the English alphabet to label the vectors in the text they were studying from. But everything else they were doing was in Chinese. <laughs> they didn't speak any English. Yeah, you've heard most of my Chinese already this morning. Uh, I, I'm going to say good morning. How are you? I'm from Canada. My name is Jason. Uh, God loves you. But when I said God loves you, the Father's eyes lit up. And it was at that point that this little boy came into the room and sat down on the other side of him. And so now there's a dad with two kids sitting there. And his dad, I, all I've said in other than I'm from Canada, God loves you because it's all I can say. And he is just glowing. Well, at that point, my two translators, who I've just kind of wandered away from, go, where the heck is Jason? <laughs> and they, they come back and find me, and they start conversing with his father, and he says, I've been praying for five months that someone would show me how to follow God, because I want to, but I don't know how. And this morning I was praying, and I had a, a, a moment in prayer where it seemed like a foreigner was going to come and tell me how to follow God. Well, um, 15 minutes later he'd become a Christian, and we'd given him a Bible, and we started, uh, he, he, we were going through his first Bible study 15 minutes after that. That kind of stuff doesn't usually happen to me. But the next day, we were walking along, and, and again, I'd been praying in the morning um, while uh, Pastor Dean was talking to one of his cousins who'd come by for breakfast, and I was praying, and we, we went walking through the community. We were going to go try to find his elementary school teacher. He was pretty sure that one of his elementary school teachers still lived in the village and was still alive, and he had a heart to try to share the gospel with his elementary school teacher. So we were walking to try to find his house. We were walking along and it started to rain. And they turned to me, um, you being the other girl from the Mandarin Foundation that was with us, and Pastor Me turned to me and said, Where's that umbrella? <laughs> it's in my pocket. They said, Get it out, get it out. If you don't know, I don't know if Cantonese born people do this as much. I haven't had that much experience with this in Canada. In China, they give you really parental advice, especially to foreigners. You're walking alongside a pond on a path, they say, whoa, 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 wait, careful. Don't fall in the pond. Someone's going to 
already sinned. And they said, who, for walking down this path, there's only one house for about a mile in any direction. We're in the middle of rural farming country. And that house doesn't have any windows pointed towards this road. There's only one door pointed toward the road, and it doesn't have any glass in it either. They're like, who's going to offer a shelter? And I said, I don't know, I guess the people in this house. And they said, there's nobody, like, there's no way they even know we're here. And just as they said that, the door opened to the house. And this couple came to the door to just look out. They were doing something that people in small town China apparently do, the same as small town Saskatchewan. They were looking out to confirm the weather. Yep, it's raining. <laughs> Chinese to understand this conversation. Yeah, I told you it was raining. Look at that noise of rain. Yeah, I guess it was raining. Look at that. It sure is raining. Blows! <laughs> it's a foreigner sitting there. <laughs> and so they invited us in. <laughs> and uh, they, as soon as they started talking uh, to Pastor B, just maybe five minutes into the conversation, the guy said this sentence. I've been praying off and on for the last eight months that someone would come and show me how to follow God. Because I want to, but I don't know how. And there's no one here to show me. So, he and his wife prayed to receive Christ, and we gave them a Bible, and we led them through their first Bible study. You know, the, the events that I experienced in China, that's not the only story. Fifteen people in total came to Christ. Uh, two of them were members of Pastor Nee's family. The other thirteen were people that, for one reason or another, I just said, we need to go talk to that person, or I just walked up to a person and started talking to me, or they walked up to me and started talking to me, and literally, two, three, five minutes later, they were becoming Christians. Um, that's not been my normal experience. I've never led 15 people to Christ in any one year of my ministry before this. And I did in just a couple of weeks. So I, I want to thank you for, for your support of the mission team and your support of missions in general in this church. I want to thank you for, for sending us and trusting the three of us to be your ambassadors in China. And I want to encourage you to think about going. Uh, I plan to go back. And I, I don't know exactly what that plan is going to look like. But I hope some of you will come with me. I think it's, there are amazing things happening by the Spirit of God. Let's uh, throw up a couple of those other pictures. So not every underground church is as underground as it used to be. One of the things that God's Spirit is doing in, in China is that the restrictions that were there previously, even two years ago when I was there, have loosened significantly. This is the building occupied by a former underground church. The, the church holds 3,000 and is packed every Sunday. The, the government-sponsored version of the church was not satisfying the local government officials for a variety of reasons, and they booted them out. It was just a small group, a handful of people. And they booted them out of the buildings and found the underground church in the area and told them, we're giving you the building instead, and handed them the keys. That was three years ago, and it went, that, that underground church was already 400, and now it's 3,000. That, it's hard to tell in the picture maybe, but that's eight stories, and it's, it's a fully developed building of eight stories. It's, it's a massive, massive, massive building built by missionaries almost 100 years ago who never could have imagined it would be used. So it's used now. There's a seminary in there. There are classes in there every night of the week. There are all kinds of amazing things happening. So that's one of the places we visit. Uh, but sometimes the church in China does still look like this. This is Pastor Yi with his uh, wife's uncle who's 94 years old. Um, and he is just becoming a Christian in that picture. But sometimes the ch church in China is very small. It still is underground in spots. And the underground church has been so persecuted that they try.
distrust the government little and come out of their hiding spaces sometimes very slowly. We saw churches that are kind of halfway public. We saw churches like the one I just showed you that are all the way public. And we saw churches where five people are huddled in a broken down farmhouse that you have to walk through a forest and a cornfield through the mud just to get to. And when you get to the five people, they won't talk to you. Even though one of their husbands is the one that led you there. And he says, these are Christians, and I thought maybe you'd want to meet them since you're having a Christian gathering here. They'll say, this isn't a Christian gathering. We don't want to meet you. Go away. Apparently, that's what they told us. I knew, they were, I knew the go away part of the translation. <laughs> <laughs> this hand gesture. <laughs> but sometimes the church is still very small. Um, it's for those places specifically that I have a heart to go because there are literally people, we ran into them all over the place in China, in several cities, in several different situations, who are begging to know how to follow God and really can't find anyone to tell them because they don't know how to find the church. Neither do we in some cases. But, but I think that somebody ought to tell them. And so that's what I'm excited about doing. And then maybe show the last picture. This one, it's tough to see in this light. But there, because I took it at the maximum part of the bad zoom lens on my cheap little aim and shoot camera. But this is taken from the eighth story of that church building. And this guy kind of runs a makeshift recycling plant in his own backyard. His yard is all piled with plastics and metals of various types, sorted and sorted and sorted again. And for some reason that morning, she came down and sat down in that chair across from an empty chair. And he sat there for 15 minutes. And then he got up and walked away. Nobody ever came and sat down and he had a chair. Nobody, I, don't, I have no idea why he sat there for 15 minutes staring at an empty chair. But that's literally what he did. He never moved, he never twitched. He sat there and stared at an empty chair for 15 minutes. And I thought, with this huge church full of people here, somebody might have to sit down in the chair opposite him and tell him about God's love. These, the, the very poor are often only a few steps away in China. Quite frankly, the, the churches that are in the open there have very little time to disciple all the people they have, and they have very little heart for the very poor. They, the, the very poor in China work all the time, and so you have to find some way to run a service that happens when they're not at work, which is sun up to sundown, seven days a week, all but two days a year. And so you have to be pretty flexible in your service plan to make it work for people like that. And the churches aren't, for the most part, really. The few that are public at all. That also grabbed my attention. And I want to learn Mandarin so that I can sit down in that chair across from him and have a conversation with him about life. Be able to say more to him than just, I'm from Canada. 